There are many times that the Lord, God, speaks to us and we make excuses that we can't hear Him. Hmm. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. Thank you for joining us today. It is a good day to read the Bible. Corey and, of course, Ryan are here to tell us more about what they're doing. Corey? Well, today I'm going to be talking about the man who wrote down the words of Jeremiah based off of Jeremiah chapter 45 when God actually speaks to the scribe. Ryan? Today I'm continuing my study from yesterday, which involved pyramids and similar structures all over the world. But in this segment, I'm going to be focusing exclusively on Egyptian pyramids and mostly on the Great Pyramid. All right, that's going to be very interesting as we continue this study. Janice, what'd you do? Today, the Commander-in-Chief. All right. Well, the Commander-in-Chief wrote his word, and we'll talk about that. So open up your Bible and your Bible guide, and let's look at this as God talks. Jeremiah 47, verses 1 through 7. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Philistines before Pharaoh attacked Gaza. Thus says the Lord, Behold, waters rise out of the north and shall be an overflowing flood. They shall overflow the land and all that is in it, the city and those who dwell within. Then the men shall cry, and all the inhabitants of the land shall wail. At the noise of the stamping hooves of his strong horses, at the rushing of his chariots, at the rumbling of his wheels, the fathers will not look back for their children, lacking courage, because of the day that comes to plunder all the Philistines, to cut off from Tyre and Sidon every helper who remains, for the Lord shall plunder the Philistines, the remnant of the country of Kaftor. Baldness has come upon Gaza. Ashkelon is cut off with the remnant of their valley. How long will you cut yourself? O oh, you sword of the Lord, how long until you are quiet? Put yourself up into your scabbard, rest and be still. How can it be quiet? seeing the Lord has given it a charge against Ashkelon and against the seashore. There he has appointed it. Jeremiah chapter 47, verses 1 through 7. Today's reading assignment in the Bible is chapter 45 through 48 of Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. You know, it's interesting because who has the right to wipe out any nation on the earth? Well, today we would say that no one has that right. But God did just that, the Lord of, God, of all, in the times of the Old Testament. In fact, God will do it again at the end of time because the Lord created humans and is the ultimate judge of right and wrong. He has the right and the power to destroy them. Jesus Christ is the reason we are not destroyed now and today. The Lord has given us an amazing time of grace and you're in it. I'm in it. We're all invited to come to him in this time and to repent and give our lives to him, avoiding the judgment for sin. This has not changed for 2000 years. Jesus Christ offered the price for sin. And he has stood the test of time. Jeremiah chapter 47 is a passage that seems to show God's holy command in judgment against Philistia. The Philistines were a nation that hated the Jews and hated their God. God rectifies the rebellion against him around 590 B.C. I want to tell you, this, this is absolutely a stunning and amazing passage of Scripture as we begin to read it. And we're, we're up on the end of Jeremiah, and over the weekend we're going to read the end of it. But, you know, this is really something. And as we study this, take your Bible guide and turn to it. Uh, because, and if you don't have a Bible guide, write for yours or call or go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and you can do, do that there. And uh, it'll take you to a PDF file. You can download it on your computer, just like it's printed 
a lot more things on that that, uh, that we don't teach on on this program because we have more time. We only have seven minutes here. A nation wiped out. Father, help us. Help us today as we look at this because this is important for us to see. Help us to hear the reality of your judgment and the reality of what you've said and how you've said it and why you did this. In Jesus' name, help us to take advantage of this time of grace. And we said together, amen and amen. Now, let's look at this because it's very, very important. Jeremiah 47, 1 and 2, here's what it says. It says, the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Philistines before Pharaoh attacked Gaza. Now, this is before Egypt attacked Gaza. Very important. Thus says the Lord, behold, waters rise out of the north and shall be an overflowing flood. They shall overflow the land and all that is in it and the city and those who dwell within. Then the men shall cry and all the inhabitants of the land shall wail. This is fascinating. There will be a great tumult when God comes back. We must realize the judgment of God, beloved. You know, I think it's important for us to understand that these judgments that happened back when Jerusalem fell, God judges the nations around them, and he uses Babylon to punish them, and then he judges Babylon. Very interesting. The way history played out there is fascinating because God is directing history. Isn't that something? Now, we could get into a lot here, but we don't have time for it, so let's go on. This gets really interesting. This is chapter 47, verse 3. Here's what it says. At the noise of the stamping hooves of his strong horses, at the rushing of his chariots, at the rumbling of its wheels. Do you see what he's doing here? He's showing us there's a whole scene that's being set up for us. Back to the scripture. The fathers will not look back for their children, lacking courage. They're going to be fearful because of the day that comes to plunder the Philistines, to cut off from Tyre and Sidon every helper who remains. For the Lord shall plunder the Philistines and the remnant of the country of Kaphtor. Really interesting. Natural love fails when the power of God's judgment comes. Okay? Families are dissolved in God's judgment. I want you to understand something. It becomes very important. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in the New Testament speaks about love. It says, I can speak in tongues, I can do all this stuff, and I'm nothing because I don't have love. Love never fails. Love always looks out for you. It doesn't look out for itself. It's not prideful. It's not arrogant. It's not, it loves truth. And that explanation of God's love is described in the Bible where God spoke to us. And that's what we're told. But natural love or love from man fails in God's judgment. We need to keep that in mind. So families and all that, if without God, God's judgment is not good for us. It's, it's, it's rough. Back to 47, verse 5. Baldness has come upon Gaza. Ashkelon is cut off from the remnant of their valley. How long will you cut yourself? Oh, oh you sword of the Lord. How long until you are quiet? Put yourself up into your scabbard and rest. Be still. How can it be quiet? seeing the Lord has given it charge against Ashkelon and against the seashore. There he has appointed it. God has aimed his judgment very specifically. God completes his judgment to perfection. The Lord is holy. He's holy. He is perfect in everything he does. Let me explain something. When we come to know the Lord, when we say to Jesus Christ, come into my life and be Lord of my life, he wakes up our spirit and he says, rise, come alive, spirit. And suddenly we're up. When God does that, things change because God now has the ability through his Holy Spirit to pour into us his character. And if we read the word and we, we learn his character, we understand that 
God, this is impossible. That's why the Bible says, seek his strength. That's why the Bible says the battle is the Lord's. Because we recognize that we're human beings and we recognize there's no way we can do it ourselves. So the Holy Spirit comes into us and changes us. And that's the difference between religion and relationship. We have relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Religion is, I don't know what that is, something man invents a way to find God. Relationship is God coming into our hearts. And he found us. And you can do that today. You can come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You simply pray and you say, Lord Jesus Christ, use that name, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, HaMashiach. I believe that you allowed yourself to die on the cross and you rose again because death could not keep you and you paid the cost of my sin and you've given me eternal life. I'm going to live after this life because I trust in you. I make you Lord of my life right now. I come to you, Lord. Be Lord of my life now. And when you pray that way, let me tell you what's going to happen. God is going to change you. And suddenly, very interestingly, your life is going to move around and you're going to see things start to radically change in your life because the Lord is now the Lord. Our life is renewed by Jesus Christ. We're renewed by him. You see, we live differently than we did before. Before we met who? Before we met Jesus Christ. That's who. Well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study. And today, my segment continues our study from yesterday, which explored pyramids and pyramid-like structures all over the world. But unlike yesterday, today, I want to focus exclusively on the Egyptian pyramids, and particularly the Great Pyramid. Now, the marvelous construction of such structures is a serious challenge for those who believe that our ancient ancestors were less intelligent than we are. Check it out. One of the big puzzles for secular archaeology has been the origin of the Egyptian pyramids. This is due to the fact that they are, as a number of researchers have pointed out, very sophisticated structures, reflecting a high degree of technological development. Further adding to the problem is that there is no evidence of technological evolution either. Indeed, as Graham Hancock notes, the archaeological evidence suggested that rather than developing slowly and painfully, as is normal with human societies, the civilization of ancient Egypt like that of the Olmecs, emerged all at once and fully formed. Indeed, the period of transition from primitive to advanced society appears to have been so short that it makes no kind of historical sense. Technological skills that should have taken hundreds or even thousands of years to evolve were brought into use almost overnight and with no apparent antecedents whatever. The Egyptian pyramids, and most notably the Great Pyramid, are excellent examples of this high technology. For example, these incredible monuments contain millions of blocks, some of which weigh up to 200 tons. Somehow, the ancient Egyptians raised these massive blocks hundreds of feet above the ground into position, a questionable task even for modern cranes. Also impressive is the level of accuracy in which these blocks were placed. Indeed, even after thousands of years, the blocks are still accurate in their placement to within a few millimeters or one-eighth of an inch or so. Even the casing stones only had an average variation of 0.01 inches over an area of 35 square feet. As Dr. Donald Chitt equips, even with modern technology, it is doubtful whether modern builders could do as well. Indeed, it was in 1881 that archaeologist Sir William Flinders Petrie surveyed the descending passage of the Great Pyramid and discovered that it had an error of only 0.20 inches over the 150-foot length of the construction portion and the entire length of the passage was within a quarter inch over 350 feet. Incredibly, this was a technology beyond that of Petrie's own time. In addition to actual construction skills, other necessary skills included rock quarrying, stone cutting and polishing, material handling and transportation. Mathematical skills also were required for architecture and surveying. 
While there are many competing theories about how the pyramids were constructed, the reality is that we do not know for certain. What we do know for certain, says author Christopher Dunn, is that the pyramid builders were as intelligent as we are. How they applied their knowledge may have been different, but it is obvious that they possess sufficient knowledge to create an artifact having a distinct feature that so far we have not been able to repeat. The bald fact is that the Great Pyramid, by any standard, old or new, is the largest and most accurately constructed building in the world. Now, not only do the Egyptian pyramids not fit in with secular history, but they actually provide strong corroboration for biblical history. For example, did you know that the massive limestone blocks of the Egyptian pyramids contain abundant fossil shells? And many of those are marine fossils. Now, why do you think there'd be such a high concentration of marine fossils in the pyramid stones? How did that happen? Well, according to Genesis 7, God brought a worldwide flood. Now, there's a lot of evidence for the flood, and the marine fossils in the pyramids is one of them. And this also helps to date the construction of these pyramids to after the global flood, not before. Remember to keep in mind that the flood would have completely decimated these structures. Now, I'm out of time right now, but if you do want more on this topic, I recommend the documentary, the documentary I did on this called 30 Out-of-Place Artifacts. Of course, you can get it through the Bible Discovery Ministry by way of mail, phone, or online. And of course, online is www.biblediscoverytv.com, biblediscoverytv.com. Uh, it is a great, great documentary. A couple of years ago, we did that. It just, I want you to do another one because you had to cut it down. You yeah, know, oh like yeah. 30 there's, artifacts you Yeah, cut those were just 30 of, you know, some of the best ones, right? Yeah. But there's actually, there's thousands of them all and over. So. I, I remember I was in Egypt and I was on top of this mountain. They said that Moses was on top of the Sinai, but it actually we know that it probably wasn't. But nevertheless, I was way up on, like, in the clouds. And I looked down and all over the place, there were these um, sort of shells from the bottom of the sea, fossilized shells. Yeah. yeah. And, and I picked one up and I said, that's, that's a shell from the bottom of the sea. How did it get up here? So I, I asked the Egyptian and he spoke to me and he laughed. He said, well, that's because of the great flood. Yeah. So they knew about the great flood. They, everybody knows that. You actually brought me a, fo a fossil from there. I still have it on my desk. It's, exactly, exactly. it's a yeah. snail. Not sure if you were allowed <laughs> yeah. to bring it back. And, and every time I look at it, I, th I think, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, they were everywhere. It was, it was absolutely stunning. <laughs> stunning. Corey? All right. Well, today I'm going to be taking a look at Jeremiah chapter 45, kind of loosely. We're looking at the character of Baruch, who is the scribe of Jeremiah. And it's unique in all of the Bible because he here, we're not speaking to the prophet, we're speaking to, you know, the man who worked with and worked for the prophet of God. So this is a bit of a unique situation. And Baruch's, you know, complaint to God is recorded earlier in the book. And now God's response to Baruch is recorded as well. So there's this care of God to people who are involved in his business and people who are trying to faithfully follow him, especially in a time where that was not the norm. That's not what was going on. So so let's take a look at some of the evidence for Baruch's life as well as, as well as some of the other people mentioned in the book of Jeremiah. The ancient city of Beth Shean plays a gruesome role in 1 Samuel chapter 31, the record of the murder and display of King Saul and his sons. During their final battle with the Philistines, Saul and sons fall. Their bodies are beheaded and stripped so that the royal armor can be displayed in pagan temples. As for their bodies, they are taken to Beth Shean and hung in victory on the city's defensive walls. Today, Beth Shean, which means House of Quiet, has been archaeologically excavated. Much of these excavations have focused on the Roman city that lies at the base of biblical Beth Shean, but some conclusions about the older city have still been arrived at. Beth Shean was built on the paths of two important roads, a north-south and an east-west. The biblical city shows evidence of Egyptian control during the time period of the judges of Israel, but there has been no evidence to date of a Philistine takeover during the days of Saul. 
A plausible explanation to this is that the Bible describes surrounding citizens picking up and fleeing from before the Philistinian army. A situation like this would leave no discernible archaeological evidence of takeover. And with the Philistines being finally defeated and ousted from Israel by King David less than a generation later, not much evidence should be expected. Unfortunately, the walls of ancient Beth Shean have yet to be found. This may be due to the lack of excavations of the biblical city on the top of the tell, or possibly due to the massive Roman building that occurred at the site. Regardless, thousands of years after the fact, the Mount of Beth Shean still stands dominating the landscape, silently holding its ancient witness. So there we go. There's still a lot more to be said about the time period of the prophet Jeremiah and also his aide, his friend, his companion, Baruch. Uh, but we're going to get there as we continue to study on in the scriptures. One of the excuses that was used was uh, that, that Baruch was turned against us and took your words and manipulated them when they wanted to go to Egypt. Right. And, and it was interesting because, you know, Barak is sort of confined over here with Jeremiah. But you know, in Jeremiah, I think it's 45, there's a, a six or seven or eight verse chapter to Barak. Yeah. And God says, now, you know, you, you want to get, have a good career and have a good life, but let me tell you something. I'm gonna destroy all this, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna give you your life, Barak. Mm -hmm. And everywhere you deal, it's a good deal. <laughs> a good deal. Yeah, I think deal. that's a pretty good deal. I mean, you know, uh, because he was around and other people were killing all of these people. He would have seen tons of Well, them. and what an interesting perspective that he would have had on it. You know, to be able to sit down and have a conversation with him would be really enlightening because he got to see the behind the scenes of the courts of Judah. And he also got to sit with Jeremiah and presumably have conversations with Jeremiah about interpreting his prophecies and very public conversations with God as well. So. Very, very interesting. Okay, Janice. And interesting with human nature, isn't it? That oftentimes when we don't like what we hear God telling us, we'll blame somebody else. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess it's that guy, Barack. Mm -hmm. He's just trying to set us up. That wouldn't be God. Commander in chief is my segment today. Who or what do you follow? And I took a look at Jer uh, Jeremiah chapter 47, and it's talking about this horrifying judgment on Philistia against the Philistines that God is going to bring, bring down. And by the time we get to verse six, we see that Jeremiah is in compassion, even towards Philistia as to the atrocities that are happening. He wants to see the end of the war. It says, uh, Jeremiah says, Oh, you sword of the Lord, how long until you are quiet? Put yourself up into your scabbard, rest and be still. But then Jeremiah, it's like you can see this shift in his mind. He realizes that what God has set in motion, nobody can stop. He corrects himself. And then he says, how can it be quiet, seeing the Lord has given it a charge against Ashkelon and against the seashore? There he has appointed it. God has given it a charge. We read that right here. If God says go, it goes. If God says come, it comes. Do this, it does. God is the commander in chief. What God speaks stands. As the word of God, so is his rod and his sword. They will accomplish everything for which God's, God sends them. Isaiah 55 verse 11, so shall my word, God says, be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God's word is true. God's word is stands over time. God's word is the truth. Hebrews 4, chapter 12. For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So knowing that, you have a choice to make. You can hear and 
know and learn and follow the word of God, or you can do what these people did at that time and blame somebody else like Barak and choose not to believe. I would ask that you would take the word of God and get it in your heart. Ask, if you have questions, ask the Lord, spend time with him. God wants a relationship with you. He's got big, strong shoulders and he's not afraid of any of your questions. He's not afraid of any of your emotions. In fact, he already knows what you're thinking and what you're gonna be doing tomorrow. He's already there. So open up to the Lord God. He wants a relationship with you today, just as he did with Jeremiah. I think it's important to remember that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God, fully God and fully man, and you have to come to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you today as we pray and as we think this through, come to the Lord and say, Jesus, I believe you came 2,000 years ago and you died on the cross. You paid the cost of sin, but death couldn't keep you. Three days later, you rose again. Death couldn't keep you. And you ascended to the Father, but you told your disciples, ask if people would hear me. I will come into their heart and I will save them. So Lord, come into my heart today and say, give me the gift of eternal life. Do you know what the Bible says in Romans 10 verses 8 and 9? It says, if you believe that and you pray that and you're serious about it, that's going to happen and you are going to become somebody who lives forever. Thank you for joining us today on this last part of the program. I want to say that God is good all the time and all the time God is good. So we pray today and we say it this way, Lord, you are holy, you are complete and you are just. I want to thank you for forgiving my sin. Thank you, Lord. And another prayer here, Lord, is help me to walk in your ways every single day of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.